In this chapter, Miranda Fricker writes on the concepts of stereotypes and prejudice and their effect on discourse and identity. We will first start with a couple of definitions. Regarding stereotypes, Fricker defines these as widely held associations between a given social group and the other attributes. They are also claimed to fuel testimonial exchange because the hearer uses cognitive shortcuts to process information. That is, when one takes part in testimonial exchange, they will use shortcuts or heuristics to process the information presented to them. Credibility judgments rely on the hearer's social categorization of the speaker based on the competence and or sincerity often reliant on known stereotypes. Freaker also examines our tendency to use prejudiced stereotypes. When are stereotypes prejudicial? It should have more than a false association. They should be epistemically culpable. For this, it needs to be irrational, resistant to evidence, as well as experienced at a long term. That is, because sometimes prejudice does not have an unethical or bad motivation behind it. It may have both positive as well as negative valence. Fricker also points out cases of epistemically non-culpable mistakes, which are most commonly termed as honest mistakes. These situations are of circumstantial epistemic bad luck, where the agent employing prejudice does so without intentional harm. Within stereotypes, there are those related to identity prejudice. These are the most morally problematic kind of prejudice, and as a social type, they have negative valence. Additionally, a problem with stereotypes is that they are informed by the collective social imagination, which can impact credibility judgments without our awareness. These images can exist even if they are contrary to one's belief, which results in internal conflict, termed as residual internalization. These prejudiced stereotypes have a number of consequences. Negative identity prejudice negatively distorts the hearer's perception of the speaker, which is detrimental to the speaker's credibility as it limits their perceived capacity as a giver of knowledge. This leads to the reduced epistemic trustworthiness. In sum, prejudiced stereotypes impact the hearer's perception of the speaker, which in turn undermines the capacity of the speaker as a giver of knowledge, stemming systematic testimonial injustice, as seen in Freaker's chapter 1. So, why is this a problem? Freaker discusses different ways where testimonial injustice leads to harm, epistemic, primary and secondary. Epistemic harm occurs when a hearer does not receive knowledge that was passed on because individuals unjustly judge others as not credible, creating an obstacle to truth. Speakers are not free when they cannot put knowledge into the public domain. Freaker even quotes Kant, who states that freedom of speech is fundamental to the authority of the polity and reason. Primary harm is the immediate harm the hearer does to the speaker, where the speaker is harmed in their capacity as a knower. Freaker takes this harm to be wronged in a capacity essential to human value, quoting Descartes in saying that rationality is essential to distinguish our value as humans, whereby being denied this is dehumanizing and humiliating. Secondary harm is divided in two categories, practical and epistemic. The practical category is reliant on an individual's belief of another to be incompetent or insincere, which may have consequences to one's career, for example, Fricker states that prejudice can be self-fulfilling. This is the case when stereotypes make themselves felt as expectations, and research has shown that expectations strongly affect performance. The epistemic category consists of when a subject of testimonial injustice loses confidence in their general intellectual abilities, causing listeners to doubt 
their credibility. When someone is doubted too often, they will begin doubting themselves. So this process reinforces itself. Persistent testimonial injustice can also inhibit the formation of self. When lacking confidence, one will not face challenges and may restrict themselves from gaining knowledge they could have otherwise gained. Furthermore, the subject is excluded from trustful interaction with others on basis of prejudice. Trustful interaction is how we form our identity. Lastly, one's identity as a knower is disputed on the basis of something that is an essential part of one's identity, because our capacity as a knower is distinctly and essentially a human quality. We would highlight this previous part on the harms of testimonial injustice as the most relevant in relation to diversity. This is because testimonial injustice limits one's perception of others, which in turn may lead to prejudices held against other social groups, not allowing these to be givers or receivers of knowledge in a diverse context. Moreover, the harm caused by testimonial injustice takes away someone's fundamental human capacity as a knower, which can lead to the perception of other social groups as less than humans and is consequently a threat to a socially diverse society. Our interpretation of Freaker's conclusion is that there are many ways in which epistemic injustice operates, harming both the individual and society. Next, we will look at the text itself. We're going to look at some of the positive and negative points of Freaker's text. Freaker reveals a number of strengths in her work one of them being the fact that the topic of testimonial injustice has not received enough attention as of yet and is an important concept for the advancements of social discourse. Additionally, the author gives the reader a sense of complexity to frame testimonial injustice as lack of credibility can be very obvious, like for example, verbalizing negative stereotypes, or can be very subtle, for example, avoiding eye contact, Hence, the author illustrates this recognition of knowing when testimonial injustice is at play can be challenging. Another strong point is that the text's main argument was quite clear to understand, which was aided by Fricker's use of illustrative examples. Lastly, Fricker does a great job explaining the harm done to the non-credible speaker, going further than the inability to convey knowledge. Stereotypes and testimonial injustice will not only decrease the confidence of the hearer in what the speaker is saying, but also the speaker will doubt themselves. This double harm is due to the systematic and evidence-resistant manner of the stereotypes in the social imagination. The weaker points of Fricker's text are also outlined in this presentation. First, the theoretical explanation is quite complex to read due to the use of philosophical vocabulary and extensive explanations. This inaccessibility makes it a text only presentable to elites, which are usually made of dominant social groups. The dominant groups are unlikely to suffer from stereotypes or prejudice as much as minorities. Hence, testimonial injustice does not seem to be a problem for them. We also question whether Fricker should address the harm done to the receiver of knowledge, for example, the dominant groups, in case of testimonial injustice in more depth. This is because there might be an effect on the speaker, the person whose credibility is doubted, but also on the hearer, the dominant group who makes these credibility judgments. Perhaps discussing the harm caused to the receiver of knowledge further could motivate the dominant group to reflect on their biases, with the possibility of acting on these biases. In the first section of the paper, Fricker defines stereotypes as able to have a positive valence. This raises two questions. First, is there a stereotype with a solely positive valence? As for instance, if I say I love blue, that implies that I like the other colors less. Are positive stereotypes also under Fricker's claim that stereotypes lead to testimonial injustice? There is reason to believe a positive stereotype does cause testimonial injustice, as the stereotype can lead to wrongly perceiving a person as having a high credibility. Thank you for listening.